are these people? Colin, I'm sorry this is going to be long, <laughs> but we're going to do it because I think it's important and no one else has talked about it. I think no one else has talked about it for multiple reasons. We'll come to find out shortly. Um, this is going to be one of those things where you're like, why did you cover this? And it's like, oh, I know why you covered this. So mm. um, I'm referencing I, a lyric by Jesse just Jet to, title. I just have to use a little boys room. So you can start by I can hear you. Cool. Uh, and I'll be back in a second. Yes, sir. Can do. So again, this is from Neuralink Volunteers, right? We're gonna we're gonna start there. We're gonna talk about some Neuralink stuff. So this is Sheer Post, right? Um, it's actually Unlimited Hangout with Stravula Pats, who I think is also over there at uh, the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. They'll do some stuff there. Um, she's she's doing it up. So, um, but she's talking about uh, weaponizing reality and the dawn of neuro warfare. Neuro warfare, you might ask, what that might be. Um, we're gonna get into it. So. We're going to start with B billionaire Elon Musk's brain-computer interface company Neuralink made headlines earlier this year for inserting its first brain implant into a human being. Musk says such implants, which are described as fully implantable, cosmetically invisible, and designed to let you control a computer or mobile device anywhere you go, are slated to eventually offer full bandwidth data streaming to the brain. Straight to the membrane. Brain company, uh, brain computer interfaces, BCIs, are quite the human achievement. As described by the University of Calgary, a brain computer interface, BCI, is a system that determines functional intent, the desire to change, move, control, or interact with something in your environment directly from your brain activity. In other words, BCIs allow you to control an application or device using only your mind. Any questions so far, Care Bear? No. Nope. Uh, Everything so, makes sense. Yes. Oh, there you go. <clears throat> what? Oh, yeah, there we go. Oh. He caught up to you. Okay. Cool. Um, you were saying? Uh. So basically, it's the literal they want to control. In some cases, yes, but it's more, in this instance, you being able to control other things. So, but yes, um, so developers and advocates of BCIs and adjacent technologies emphasize that they can help people regain abilities lost due to aging, ailments, accidents, or injuries, thus improving quality of life. A brain implant created by Swiss-based Ecola Polytechnique Federale in Maslan, for example, has allowed a paralyzed man to walk again just by thinking. Others go further. Neuralink's goal is to help people surpass able-bodied human performance. Yet, great ethical concerns arise with such advancements, and the tech is already being used for questionable <coughs> purposes to better plan logistics and boost productivity, for example, some Chinese employers have started using emotional surveillance technology to monitor workers' brain waves, which, combined with AI algorithms, can spot incidents of workplace rage, anxiety, or sadness. The example showcases how personal a technology can become that is normalized in daily life. Wouldn't you like that, Colin, as you're keeping the kiddos? An, an emotional tracking device? Wouldn't that be fun? Um... But the ethical, oh no, he's going to kill one of them kids. <laughs> uh, anyway, so the ethical ramifications of DCIs and other emergency neurotechnologies don't stop the consumer market or the workplace. Governments and militaries are already discussing and experimenting on the roles they could play in wartime. We can't have a technology without it needed for war, Gary Bear. Indeed, many are describing the human body and brain as war's next domain, with a 2020 NATO-backed paper on cognitive warfare describing the phenomenon's objective as making everyone a weapon, the brain will be the battlefield of the 21st century. The NATO-backed paper in 2020, Okay? So, 
on this new battlefield, an era of neuro weapons, which can broadly be defined as technologies and systems that can either enhance or damage a warfighter or target cognitive and or physical abilities to otherwise attack people or critical societal infrastructure has begun. In this exploration of the race to apply the latest neuro technologies to war and beyond, I investigated how the neuro weapons of tomorrow, including VCIs that may allow for brain to brain or brain to machine communication, have the capacity to expand conflicts into a new domain, the brain, while also bringing a new dimension to both hard and soft power struggles of the future. In response to ongoing neurotechnology developments, some alleged neuro rights will protect people's minds from possible privacy infringements and a myriad of ethical issues that new neurotechnologies may pose in need. Come, however, neural rights advocates close proximity to the very organizations advancing these neurotechnologies deserve scrutiny and potentially suggest the neural rights movement is poised instead to normalize advanced neurotechnology presence in daily life, perhaps forever changing human relationships with machines, and I'm sure that will be for both good and bad. Indeed, Neuroscience's very origin lie in a war, as Dr. Wallace Mendelssohn explains in Psych Today. Just as American neurology was born in the Civil War, the roots of neuroscience are embedded in World War II. He explains that while the bond between war on neuroscience has contributed to meaningful advances of human condition, like the improved understanding of ailments like PTSD, it has left some worried about neuroscience's possible military applications. Controversial, yet well-known government's attempts to learn more about the brain include Project Blue, uh, Bluebird slash Artichoke, a 1950s-era project that worked to determine whether people could be involuntarily made to carry out assassinations through hypnosis, as well as the especially infamous MK Ultra, where human mind control experiments were carried out in a variety of institutions in the 1950s and 60s, these projects' respective conclusions, however, did not signal an end to the U.S. government's interest in invasive mind studies and technology. Rather, governments internationally have been interested in the brain sciences ever since, investing heavily in neuroscience and neurotech research. That's where some of that military tax funding is going to, Colin. Initiative and research explored in this article, like the Brain Initiative and the United States Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, otherwise known as DARPA, their next-generation non-surgical neurotechnology are often portrayed as altruistic strides towards improving brain health, helping people recover lost physical or mental abilities, and otherwise improving quality of life. Unfortunately, a deeper look reveals the prioritization of military might. The military is intensely interested in emerging neurotechnologies. The Pentagon's research arm, DARPA, directly or indirectly funds about half of invasive neural interface technology companies in the U.S. In fact, as Nico McCarthy and Milan Sikovic highlight in their 2023 write-up of Dar DARPA's neurotech efforts, that DARPA has initiated at least 40 neurotechnology-related programs over the past 24 years. From the Interface describes the current state of affairs as DARPA funding effectively driving the BCI research agenda. Look, there you go, Colin. That that can, you know, invade your nightmares. This is this is the future soldier at U.S. Army Recruiting Command. Look look how look how cute he looks. He's got the little alien gun and everything. It's fun. Um. So as we shall see. Before you before you yes. hold on. Before you, what is our cash app link? Do what? Oh, uh, it should be. Asking. Uh, money sign Indie News Network, I think. I it, hold on. Uh, I have to go all the way to the top. I'm at slide 107. I think like slide right before this. CashApp.com slash Money Sign Indie News Network. That's it. So what slide was on? 103. Right. I think so. 103. Um. So. Controversial, yes, that's what we just did. Um, I might have went to, there we go. So, uh, as we shall see, such projects, many of which focus on somehow enhancing the capabilities of the recipient or wearer of a given piece of technology, 
are making activities like telepathy, mind control, and mind reading once the stuff of science fiction at least plausible, if not tomorrow's reality. So, as McCarthy and Sikovic explain on their Substack, for example, the 1999 DARPA funded fundamental research at the BioInfo Micro Interface Program led to significant firsts in brain computer interfaces research, including allowing monkeys to learn to control a brain machine interface to reach and grab objects without moving their arm. In another project from the program, monkeys learn to position cursors on a computer screen without the animals emitting any behavior where signals extrapolated from the monkey's moving skulls were read and decoded to move the mouse. McCarthy and Sikovic also highlight that in more recent years, the DARPA-funded scientists have also created the world's most dexterous bionic arm with biodirectional controls, have used brain-computer interfaces to accelerate memory formation and recalling, and have even transferred a memory, a specific neural firing pattern from one rat to another, with a rat receiving the memory, almost instantaneously learned, to perform a task that simply took weeks of training to learn. Okay? Does that sound like the Matrix right. to you? Um, yes. Sounds like it to me. Um, just download Kung Fu. So, this is from a TED Med app. So, I'm going to throw this on it. Um, but this, is, this will explain a bit of what was happening. We started with a superstar monkey called Aurora that became Aurora, that's who we started with. Came one of the superstars of this field. And Aurora liked to play video games. As you can see here, <laughs> she likes to use a joystick like any one of us, any of our kids, to play this so game. And as a good do? primate, she even tries to cheat before she gets the right answer. So even before a target appears that she's supposed to cross with the cursor that she's controlling with this joystick, so there's, Aurora there's is trying to there. find the target, no matter where it is. And if she's doing that, because every time she crossed that target with the little cursor, she gets a drop of Brazilian orange juice. And I can tell you, any monkey will do anything for you if you get the little drop of Brazilian orange juice. <laughs> Actually, any primate will do that. Think about that. Well, while Aurora was playing this game, as you saw, and doing, you know, a thousand trials a day and getting 97% correct and 350 ml of orange juice, we are recording the brainstorms they're producing in her head and sending to a robotic arm that was learning to reproduce the movements that Aurora was making. Because the idea was to actually turn on this brain machine interface and have Aurora play the game just by thinking without the interference of her body. Her brainstorms would control an arm that would move the cursor and cross the target. And to our shock, that's exactly what Aurora did. She played the game without moving her body. So every trajectory that you see the cursor now, this is the exact first moment she got that. That's the exact first moment a brain intention was liberated from the physical domains of a, of a body of a primate and could act outside in that outside world just by controlling an artificial device. And Aurora kept playing the game, kept, kept finding that little target and getting the orange juice that she wanted to get, that she craved for. Well, she did that because she, at that time, had acquired a new arm. The robotic arm that you see moving here 30 days later after the first um, video that I showed to you is under the control of Aurora's brain and is moving the cursor to get to the target. And Aurora now knows that she can play the game with this robotic arm, but she has not lost the ability to use her biological arms to do what she pleases. She can scratch her back, she can scratch one of us, she can play another game. By all purposes and means, Aurora's brain has incorporated that artificial device as an extension of her body. The model of the self that Aurora had in her mind has been expanded to get one more arm. Well, we did that 10 years ago. Just feed forward 10 years. Just last year, we realized that you don't need even to have a robotic device. You can just build a computational body, an avatar, a monkey avatar. And you can actually use it for uh, our monkeys to either interact with them, or you can train them to assume in a virtual world the first person's perspective of that avatar. 
and use her brain activity to control the movements of the avatar arms or legs. And what we did basically was to train the animals to learn how to control these avatars and explore objects that appear in the virtual world. And these objects are visually identical, but when the avatar crosses the surface of these objects, there is an electrical message, message that is proportional to the micro tactile texture of the object that goes back directly to the monkey's brain. Did you, did you catch that? What yeah. that was doing? So that's, you know, if yeah. it's over an object, it will send a signal through the brain so that, like, it knows what's, like, the right signal. So without hearing anything, without seeing anything, it is getting tactile feedback. Informing the brain what is that the avatar is touching. And in just four weeks, the brain learns to process this new sensation and acquires a new sensory pathway, like a new sense. And you truly liberate the brain now because you are allowing the brain to send motor commands to move this avatar, and the feedback that comes from the avatar is being processed directly by the brain without the interference of the skin. So what you see here is this is the design of the task. When you're going to see an animal basically touching these three targets, and it has to select one because only one carries uh, the reward, the orange juice that they want to get. And he has to select it by touch using a virtual arm, an arm that doesn't exist. And that's exactly what they do. This is a complete liberation of the brain from the physical constraints of the body in the motor and a perceptual task. The animal is controlling the avatar to touch the targets and is sensing the texture by receiving an electrical message directly in the brain. And the brain is deciding what is the texture associated to the reward. The, the legends that you see in the movie doesn't appear for the monkey. And by the way, they don't read English anyway. So they are here just for you to know that the correct target is shifting position. And yet they can find them by tactile discrimination and they can press it and select it. Any questions? Like, what? That's scary. That's scary. Yeah. Very. It, it, <sighs> Where to begin with this? This is like... <laughs> we, but we, again, thinking... And, and thanks to you... Like, my mind automatically goes this to this now, that it doesn't have to be an arm. Yeah. It could be a drone. Mm -hmm. That you can essentially program a drone, especially in the military, to do whatever you want it to do. Like, yeah. just by thinking, go to this place and uh -huh. do with this thing. Like, that's... That's that drone movie, basically, that you made me watch, like, last As year. One of, like, it's also every dystopian sci-fi, like, ever. This is The Matrix, <laughs> this is Ready Player One. I mean, it's everything that's bad with all of that. So, you're, you're wondering the war effort with this, right? Because that's what I was wondering, too. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can point at a target and select it. Hmm. So, we're going to make right. things that are unaware of what they're doing, like, target things and you know that's what, what's that uh now i'm gonna forget that one ender's game that's like the ender's game thing too he was anyway i won't spoil that for people but you know black mirror episodes it's just the worst so the brain initiative a u.s government initiative founded in 2013 is aimed at revolutionizing our understanding of the human brain to accelerate the capacities of the neuroscience and neurotechnologies inspired by the earlier Human Genome Project, which ran until 2003 and generated the first sequence of the human genome. The Brain Initiative markets itself as an initiative working to address common brain disorders like Alzheimer's and depression through intense research of the brain and its operations. Uh, next. 
led by the National Institute of Health, the National Science Foundation, and DARPA. Its prominent private partners include the Allen Institute for Brain Sciences, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the Kavli Foundation, and the Salt Institute for Biological Studies. This mix of actors effectively makes the Brain Initiative an opaque public-private partnership. Like many neurotech and adjacent initiatives, the Brain Initiative depicts itself as a research-forward public effort that can improve human well-being. Yet, cash flow suggests that its priorities lie more in the military sphere. As per 2013 reporting from Scientific American, DARPA is the biggest funder of the Brain Initiative. So, um, Colin, by the way, just try to leave Discord and come back and see if your net fixes a little bit while I continue. Um, but what does DARPA's interest in the Brain Initiative amount to, practically speaking? Apparently, the stuff of science fiction. Um, so, Indeed, an article titled DARPA and the Brain Initiative, an apparently now deleted page on DARPA's website, explores DARPA's electronic collaboration with the Brain Initiative. Co-projects include the ElectRx program, which aims to help the human body heal itself through neuromodulation of organ function. Through injectable ultra-miniaturized devices, the Haptics program, which is working on neural interface microsystems, that communicate externally to deliver naturalistic sensations, especially to make prosthetic limbs feel and touch naturally. Remember that whole touch target is correct thing, right? Um, mm -hmm. And the ReNet program, which aims to create technologies able to extract information from the nervous system quickly enough to control complex machines. Although such projects appeal state-of-the-art technologies to the brain to maximize its utilization in and out of conflict, perhaps one day allow for self-healing, a rehabilitated sense of touch for those with lost limbs and brain machine communication systems that utilize thoughts to operate for machinery. Adjacent neurotech efforts include DARPA's next-generation non-surgical neurotechnology, which has a budget of at least $125 million. According to DARPA's 2018 funding brief for the project, a neural interface that enables fast, effective, an intuitive, hands-free interaction with military systems by able-bodied warfighters is the ultimate program goal. In plain language, the project is about developing technology that can help warfighters interact and command military infrastructure, infrastructure planes, drones, bombs, etc., with their thoughts and without the need for an invasive neural link style implant. I also believe that, you know, there's plenty of our uh, veterans with wounded limbs and stuff like that that they might still want piloting things. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, mm -hmm. So, look, there, there they are. Moves in their little Xbox controller, right? So this is DARPA's Cognitive Technology Threat Warning System. It combines soldiers, EEG brainwave scanners, 120 megapixel cameras, and multiple computers running cognitive visual processing algorithms into a cybernetic hive mind. Okay. So those words sound fun? Um, DARPA has provided funding to a number of institutions and orgs, including Rice University and Battelle, a Columbus, Ohio-based science and technology development company and military intelligence contractor, to take on critical research towards these ends. According to a Rice University press release, Rice University neuroengineers are leading an ambitious DARPA-funded project to develop Moana a non-surgical device capable of both encoding neural activity in one person's visual cortex and create, recreating it in another in less than one twentieth of a second. Did you catch that one? Yes. Memory transfer is what that sounds like. Um, the Moana Project researchers have been working on the wireless linkage of brains, even using a remote control to hack into fruit fly brains to command their way. Meanwhile, Batyel's N3 uh, funds are developing brainstorms, brainstorms, an injectable bi-directional brain computer interface which one day could, in tandem with a helmet, be used by someone to direct or control vehicles, robots, and other instruments with their thoughts. In addition to an investment in neurotech projects facilitating brain-based communications and operations of various techs, 
neurotech advancement, including improving or augmenting the brain's capacity to operate in myriad ways that will assist fighters on the battlefield. Enhancements that claim to improve soldiers' battlefield performance are not new, have previously included a list of drugs, cocaine, and the like. Recent developments in neuroscience have jump-started new possibilities with tech and techniques included, including DCIs, there's that brain control interface, neuropharmacologies, and or electric currents to stimulate the brain potentially, according to the Small World's Wars Journal, improving warfighter performance by enhancing memory, concentration, motivation, and situational awareness while negating the physiological ills of an increased sleep, stress, pain, and traumatic memories. You can just suck those memories right on out, Care Bear, give them to someone else. Um, indeed, augmented cognition has been an area of focus for DARPA, which worked to develop tech capable of exceeding by any order of magnitude the information management capacity of warfighters in the early 2000s. More recently, University of Florida computer science and information researchers in 2022 have received DARPA support to work to augment human cognition by providing task guidance augmented reality headset technology in extreme environments, including high-hazard and risky operations. And similar initiatives to better understand and otherwise enhance the brain and its capacities to take on myriad, especially war-focused tasks, are ongoing. Notably, Spanish researchers developed a human brain-to-brain <coughs> interface in 2014 that allowed humans to communicate with each other by only thinking. The project was funded by the European Commission's Future in Emerging Technology, which is often described as a DARPA equivalent, indicating international interest in developing adjacent technologies. Other such efforts around the globe include the EU-funded Human Brain Project, the China Pro Brain Project, Japan's Brain Minds Initiative, and Canada's Brain Canada. Dr. Raphael Yust, who I uh, shall discuss in more detail, who helped propose the Brain Initiative is also the coordinator for the International Brain Initiative, which coordinates neurotech efforts and policy-making discussions on the subject at the international level. So here you go. Here's the Brain Initiative timeline, right? The Obama announces Brain Initiative, DARPA commit $100 million in 2014, FDA and DARPA join, $400 million per year funding period, $500 million per year funding period for application of new tools. Right? So, you know, fun stuff, right? Look, federal partners. We got the NIH, we got FDA, all that stuff are involved. So, you know, fun. Um, but anyway, dystopian or not, DARPA and its collaborators and counterparts have been working over the decades to make once unbelievable activities like brain to brain and brain to machine communication possible if not likely in the years to come, as we will see such technologies impact on the international stage, the battlefield, and daily life alike will be profound if realized. So, ultimately, the advances of emerging DCIs and adjacent tools on the battlefield and conflict are double-sided, as any advancement made to boost a warfighter's performance can often be applied toward destructive purposes in neural warfare. In other words, the brain is capable of being enhanced as well as attack. In 2024, Rand report speculates if BCA technologies are hacked or compromised, a malicious adversary could potentially inject fear, confusion, or anger into a BCI commander's brain and cause them to make decisions that result in serious harm. That academic Nicolin Evans speculates further that neural implants could control an individual's mental function, perhaps to man manipulate memories, emotions, even to torture the wearer. Based on those considerations and speculations, if BCIs are used in mass at either the warfighter or civilian level, it seems plausible that some attacks could hone on the BCIs of hostile persons, warfighters or otherwise, to manipulate the contents of their mind or even brainwash them in some capacity. Meanwhile, academic Armand Christian even posts that forms of mind control found in nature, such as those utilized by gene manipulating parasites, could eventually be possible. In a 2016 article on neural warfare, he wrote, Microbiologists have recently discovered mind-controlling parasites that can manipulate the behavior of their hosts according to their needs by switching genes on or off. Since human behavior is at least partially influenced by their genetics, non-lethal behavior-modifying genetic bioweapons, or 
spread through a highly contagious virus could thus be in principle possible. Christian's observations regarding what's possible are chilling. The realities of Rice University researchers already having hacked into fruit fly brains and commanding their wings via remote control as previously described, perhaps more so. While chemical warfare has largely been banned on the international level, gaps in legislation and enforcement leave room for possibilities of different types of chemical attacks or manipulations that target the brain. In this respect, Christian posits that biochemical calmatives and maldurants could incapacitate populations on a mass scale, or oxycotton could otherwise make them docile, subduing them for an enemy benefit. Ultimately, as academics hygiene, Li Junhu and Jing Bua Wang posit in the Chinese Journal of Traumatology, putting the brain front and center as a military target that can be injured, interfere with, or enhance could establish a whole new brand, land, sea, space, and sky global combat mode. As I will show this emerging brain, land, sea, space, and sky global combat mode appears poised to change how conflict between nation states are realized and fought entirely. As the world endures major wars in Ukraine and now the Middle East, with Israel's ongoing destruction of Gaza, neurowarfare is also on the horizon. Indeed, the technologies outlined in the previous section appear slated to transform geopolitical relations as both hard and soft power tools, which could then be used to manipulate populations, lifestyles, worldviews, and even cognitive abilities to make them viable to someone else's will. Of course, various soft power tactics have long worked to influence the mind, Political allegiances and socioeconomic realities of civilians in hostile territories. The U.S., for example, has often extensive propaganda campaigns as part of its color revolutionary efforts for regime change in countries and governments deemed inconvenient to American geopolitical goals. Yet, neuroweapons, if used on a broad scale, seem positioned to take things to another level. As Georgetown University neurology and biochemistry professor, and director of the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies, Dr. James Giordano, explains in a 2020 article entitled Redefining Neuroweapons, Emerging Capabilities in Neuroscience and Neurotech. Neural-based advancements could theoretically be used to exercise social economic power elsewhere or otherwise disrupt societies in ways that do not involve explicit military action. Shockingly, he mentions that these disruptions could theoretically be done through the denigration of hostile groups, cognitive, or emotional states. Indeed, neurotech can be employed as both soft and hard weapons in competition with adversaries. In the form of sense, neurotech research and development can be utilized to exercise social economic power and global markets, while in the latter sense, neurotech can be employed to augment friendly forces' capabilities and to denigrate cognitive emotive, and or behavioral abilities of hostile, right? So, mm -hmm. as Giordano elaborates in another article, the destructive capabilities of neuroweaponry make them especially valuable in non-kinetic engagements because they can put the perpetrators at a strategic advantage or kinetic response to non-kinetic neuro neuroweaponry, however profound, may appear to aggressive. In this context, kinetic engagements can be best described as overt or hot military engagements, were active and sometimes lethal <coughs> forces used. Um, conversely, non-kinetic engagements refer to more covert strategies and activities to counter an enemy, including within the diplomatic digital economics and perhaps now the neurosphere. Giordano goes on to say that in a recipient of neurowarfare does not sufficiently respond to attack, the neuroweapon's disruptive influence and its possible strategically destructive effect become increasingly manifest. In other words, neural warfare is in position to drive nation-states geopolitical strategies on how geopolitical tensions fester or explode in the future. As Giordano has implied via his reference to socio-economic power, it appears non-kinetic neural warfare seems likely to impact not only soldiers and military outcomes, but also civilians and the soci societies they live in, especially as states initiate hostility. As a 2020 NATO-sponsored study in why cognitive warfare matters, future conflicts will likely occur amongst the people digitally first and physically thereafter in proximity to hubs of political and economic power. We've seen that before. Namely, as Christian notes in a 2016 article, it seems possible that neuro-warfare could even manipulate political leaders and populations to suppress their free will, 
enabling perpetrators to assert their political will on entire populations without resorting to kinetic responses. Here, a variety of tools, especially those described earlier, could be used in tandem to disorient, placate, or devastate the masses on a large scale. Christian writes, in a defensive function, neural warfare may, may use to suppress conflicts before they can break out. Occupied populations could be more easily pacified. Palmatives could be put in the drinking water, where populations could be sprayed with oxytocin to make them more trusting. Potential terrorists may be detected using brain scans and then chemically or otherwise neutered. <coughs> this obviously creates the possibility of creating a system of high-tech repression, where in the words of writer Aldous Huxley, a method of control could be established by which a people can be made to enjoy a state of affairs by which any decent standard they ought not to enjoy. Like the Matrix. Um, as Christian Mintz is aptly bringing Aldous Huxley's Brave New World prescription for the future in the conversation, current circumstances have set the stage for possible manipulation and top-down, high-tech repression at all levels, making it difficult for those experiencing it to even understand their previous freedoms have been stripped from them. Indeed, Christian explains that neuro warfare could transform hostile societies, cultures, and values, even collapse them based on the motion through technology could induce. Offensive neuro warfare would be aimed at manipulating the political and social situation in another state. It could have social values, culture, popular beliefs, and collective behaviors of change or political directions, for example, by way of regime change through democratizing other societies. However, offensive neuro warfare could also mean collapsing adversarial states by creating conditions of lawlessness, insurrection, and revolution. For example, by inducing fear, confusion, or anger, adversarial states could be destabilized using advanced technologies of diversion, sabotage, environmental modification, and gray terrorism followed by a direct military attack. As a result, the adversarial state would not have the capacity to resist the policies of a covert aggressor. Ultimately, as per the circumstances described by defense and neuroscience tech, analysts and academics in space, neural weapons could become an unprecedented new driver of soft power, where minds are a target of influence in ways that were previously unimaginable, subsequently in kinetic exchanges, Minds could become targets to denigrate or destroy in the world of neural warfare. However, increasingly, as it seems that the line between kinetic and non-kinetic is becoming blurred, as war moves to target not just physical reality, but humans' internal reality through the brain. As emerging neurotech increasingly jeopardize the mind's sanctity in the outside of wartime conditions, some are calling for the protection of the brain through neural rights. Groups like Columbia University's Neural Rights Foundation whose stated goal is to protect the human rights of all people from the partitional misuse or abuse of neurotechnology have sprouted to advocate for the matter, and neural rights policy discussions are ongoing in high places like the EU and the United Nations Human Rights Council. Chile, meanwhile, has been praised by groups like UNESCO for its legislative efforts in the area, which has included adding brain-related rights to the country's constitution. Neural rights have been de depicted in the media as protections that ensure emerging neural techs are only used for altruistic purposes. However, a closer look at neural rights initiatives and adjacent legislation suggests many of these pushing for neural rights are in fact facilitating the emerging tech's normalization within the consumer market and everyday life through the creation of legislative frameworks. This opens up possibilities for what unlimited hangout contributing editor Whitney Webb describes as neural markets. Indeed, those backing neural rights efforts deserve scrutiny for their close proximity to the very defense industry and adjacent institutions proliferating the controversial neurotech we've described earlier. For instance, Dr. Rafael Yust, who heads Columbia University of Neural Rights Foundation and University Cavalry Institute, helped pitch the now heavily DARPA influenced and funded brain initiative in the U.S. government. He is also the coordinator of the Brain Initiative, 650 international centers, and participated in projects like those I outlined in this article earlier. Through research in genetic engineering on mice, for example, Dr. Yus has helped pioneer technology that can read and write to the brain with unprecedented precision, where he can even make the mice see things that aren't there. Despite the use proximity to the very ores researching and promoting questionable neural texts, Right, he's one of the primary actors behind Chile's neural rights legislation. 
Indeed, the legislation appears less revolutionary within the context of Chile's legacy as a testing ground for a neoliberal policy-making effort created <coughs> abroad. What's more, legal scholars have argued, neural rights, as proposed, are inherently flawed from a legal standpoint. And Jan Christoph's public writing that the neural rights proposal is tainted by neuroexceptionalism and neuroessentialism and lacks grounding in relevant scholarship. Alejandro Seniga Fahuri, Luis Villan Ben Villa Vic Inicio, Miranda, Daniel Zaro Morales, and Ricardo Salas Venegras argue that the neural rights concept is legally redundant and is based on an out, outdated Cartesian reductionist philosophy thesis, which advocates the need to create new rights in order to shield a specific part of the human body, the brain. Whenever the legal system is fact and is debatable, still it's odd that neural rights legislative proposals are being pushed around the world, despite being apparently unable to withstand scrutiny from legal scholars. Indeed, neural rights legislation is under construction in a number of countries, especially in Latin America, apparently in a manner representing of many recent top-down global policy initiatives that have come to pass in previous years, right, like the coronavirus one. In any case, neurotexts like BCIs and the normalization of the consumer level could pose a myriad of ethical problems. For example, DARPA's augmented cognition efforts to soup up warfighters' brains are described earlier in the article it brought to the consumer market could quickly wreak havoc and perhaps even create cognitive inequities if inaccessible to most. As Dr. Youth himself told the New York Times, certain groups will get this tech and will enhance themselves. This is a really serious threat humanity. That's the New York Times saying that. To address this alleged problem of accessibility, one of the neural rights proposals crafted by Youth in the Morningside Group, a group of scientists which, after being called together by Youth, has worked to identify priorities they consider neural rights is the right to fair access to mental augmentation. But it's not hard to imagine neural rights legislation is facilitating a number of dystopian scenarios. The very availability of such tech be well put economic or social pressure. Uh, where 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 is they at? Social pressure. Such take me social pressure on the general population to receive or use it, perhaps in the form of state subsidized BCIs, even state mandated BCIs for some professions or groups of people. What does that sound like, Colin? Didn't you have? You had to have stuff mandated to you, right? Um. Hmm. So even those in wealthier countries could cognitively augment themselves in ways unavailable in poor countries. It seems unlikely, after all, that truly equal access to cognitive augmentation could be facilitated internationally, bringing in new, untold advantages with global geopolitical impacts. In any case, it's curious that equitable access to cognitive augmentation is being legislated upon through neural rights initiatives without substantive debate as to whether such augmentation should be allowed in the first place or is even safe, ultimately, rather than protect people from the possible ethical harms of emerging neurotech, neural rights legislation ultimately appears poised, normalize and facilitate the arrival of the brain chips and other advanced and often dystopian neurotechs discussed in the investigation into daily life. Although ongoing strikes to enhance and in turn degrade and destroy warfighter capabilities on the battlefield through tools like DCI and other implantables, neuropharmacologies, these and efforts to augment cognition may well transform the nation of warfare, kinetic or otherwise, as militaries put the brain front and center in conflict. How does a way to sidestep the possible ramifications of these technologies Neural rights, which have been proposed by persons closely affiliated with the orgs creating the tech in the first place, ultimately appears to be about normalizing the tech and introducing it and integrating it within the public sphere. So, I think I'm going to pause there um, and let people go finish that article, because I think it's just closing up. So, um, thoughts, Care Bear? Lot to take in. Um, yeah. Um, um, but again, it's. I will admit this. Well, let me ask you this, because hmm. you, you had, you wanted to talk about this. Yeah. Why? 
Well, I, I think part of it is is that I, I think we're already seeing a lot of this information war, right? And people don't know why or how it's working, right? You know, uh, Whitney Webb talked about this extensively with the digital front, right, and how they're manipulating that. But um, there's a, a Star Trek episode in, I think, New Space Nine, right? Where one of the characters <coughs> is found out to have had genetic, uh, like enhancements, right? Mm -hmm. But that, that, but that was illegal in the Federation, right? To do because it essentially puts you above someone else, right? It's essentially performance enhancing drugs for life, right? So I think with these brain chips, they, they talked about that, right? Where there's going to be. Essentially, that will be by can you afford them or not, right? So someone could theoretically just think better, than you, you know, with a brain chip or vice versa, you know. So that's part of this, too. So, uh, you know, and I definitely think you're going to start seeing that on the battlefield for sure. So, and be careful. I'm also with just kind of wondering what... Yeah. Our audience, like, why you th why did you think it was important for them to at least know about this? Well, I think for stuff like mandates and things like that, you know, to be leery of, of some of this coming down the road, you know? So, especially as we're going to start to see legislation, I'm sure, you know? But mm. that's why I brought it. So, but, you know... This is talking about things. This is why we're demonetized. So you can always go to codashv.com slash DVDs network. Give us a little donation there. Scan the QR code on your screen. Put exclamation mark donate in chat. Leave us a little super chat. Um, but if you can't do that, just like and subscribe. Do the easy things to do. Share, comment, you know, give us a little bit of engagement. So thankfully, but.